You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore daddy. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Unfortunately, we did not get any help whatsoever yesterday. All the wrong people won. I mean, Tampa Bay, who cares, but it's frustrating. And uh, the path to the number one seed has been dropped significantly. We cannot get a number one seed unless Seattle loses to the Arizona Cardinals. So, go number two seed. But anyways, as of today, um, we are going to spend some time talking about all the other games. There's not a ton of implications. I mean, everything's kind of down to, you know, Seattle. Uh, Packers-Vikings, obviously, is important and whatever. But uh, I want to walk through some of those things. Got some questions. Some of those I'm going to push off to Monday. A little bit of news, etc., etc. You know, whatever. As usual, we'll see how far we get down this list. Uh, one of the questions I do want to get to today is from Nick. Uh, thank you very much, Nick, for the Venmo donation. I greatly appreciate that, especially around these times. You know how it is. Um, and also, as usual, a big thank you to Ryan, who's been a regular supporter. It's very, very much appreciated. And for those that don't know, Venmo is also an option. I don't mention it much, but it's it's in the link of links in the description if you are so inclined to search around. So we'll get to that. Otherwise... If you appreciate uh, the work I'm doing, the five-star iTunes review is very, very helpful. Make sure you get into the Packernet Facebook group and like the Packernet Podcast Facebook page. I think that's all I got for you. There are technically still two um, giveaways that are active. One of them is when we get to 700 followers. There's going to be an 8x10 giveaway, a signed uh, 8x10 of Johnny Jolly. And I'm still going to honor my uh, free t-shirt giveaway if we ever get to 100 shares. So if you go to the Facebook group, the very top post is just basically an advertisement for the show. You give it a share and you're entered. It's that simple. So if and when we ever cross that, free t-shirt of your choice in my store. By the way, I got some merch, man. If you want to check it out, there's a link in the description. Otherwise, that's about it. Why don't we go ahead and take our break and we'll look at some stuff. So I did officially get my first confirmation of a Packer fan going to uh, Minnesota. Chris is coming up from Chicago. I'm assuming you're still in Chicago. I don't know. But he uh, sent me a text on the Pack Daddy bat phone, the Pack phone, and uh, said he's going to head up for the game. So that's fantastic. If you are at all interested in going to this game, I've got a solution for you. Download the Vivid Seats app. Find you some sweet, sweet tickets in just the right spot for just the right price. If you can find it, the right tickets, that is, you can rest assured that these tickets are going to be backed by a 100% buyer guarantee. You're also going to get Vivid Seats rewards earned on every single purchase. And if this is your first time buying tickets off of Vivid Seats, you can enter promo code OVERTIME and receive a discount of up to $100. If you're like me and you can't quite make it to the game, that's fine, because i got another solution for you. It's CBS Sports HQ! And conveniently, today's episode of the Packernet Podcast is brought to you by CBS Sports HQ, the brand new streaming sports news network. It's live 24 7. It costs you nothing. That's right, it's sports coverage that's always on and always free. Always. The benefit of CBS Sports HQ is coverage that's always focused on the game. It's got tons of highlights, it's got breaking news as it happens, fantasy advice, uh, gambling picks, analysis, and all that kind of good stuff. And again, it's just 24 7. Usually the first thing I do before I start the podcast is whip out the app to see what, was been, what has been posted the last few minutes. Because there's something new that was just posted at 3 o'clock in the morning. You can just download the CBS Sports app on your phone, Apple TV, Roku, Fire TV, any other connected device at any time. And there's no fake debates, just sports for real sports fans at a great price of completely free. You don't even have to log in or sign up or anything. Download the CBS Sports app and watch CBS Sports HQ today. So I might as well start with the injury report because there's no real news there. Um, the only thing outside of Dalvin Cook... Well, maybe this is new news. It is actually officially because I didn't know this yesterday. Dalvin Cook is officially out. I don't think we knew that yesterday. I don't know. But he is out. The big question is going to be Alexander Madison. I My expectation is that he is going to play. However, it is an ankle injury. And it's one of those things where, first of all, that's something you got to be very cautious about. In other words, if it was... 
I don't know. I'm not. I, I can't think of anything. But if it was something else, maybe you could push through it. But when it, when it's your ankle and you're a running back, it's kind of important. A couple other notes on that. Number one, even if he tries to push through it, there's a possibility that he's going to end up going out because it's easy to re re injure an ankle injury when you're a running back. Number two, there's also every reason to believe that he maybe isn't going to be quite a hundred percent, meaning some of his cuts. Maybe some of his burst isn't exactly going to be up to what it has been all year. So either way, this isn't super great for the Vikings. It's one of those things where, I mean, even if it's feeling 100%, sometimes you're just nervous about it. You know, like, that's one of the things they say about somebody who comes back from an ACL injury, is trusting that everything is fine. Because a lot of times people are kind of baby in that knee because they're just they're worried about it, right? This thing just ripped. They just have this psychological thing where, it, you know, I, I need to be cautious and kind of baby this side of my body, not push off on that leg too much. So, anyways, maybe I'm overthinking it, but I'm also just kind of maybe hoping a little bit. Um, on the Packers side, Dean Lowry is questionable. I'm assuming he's going to play, but make sure you keep an eye on this. And if you're playing the stock market game, make sure either way you're keeping an eye on this because stuff can pop up at any time. And it seems like just about every week somebody goes all in on somebody that just gets shut down. So just pay very close attention to that. Otherwise, not super important news because he was new to the team anyways. But uh, Yash Nijman, who just came up, they just brought him up to the regular roster, um, hurt his elbow slash tricep. They took him down, put him on IR, and so they replaced him with offensive tackle John Leglu, which, you know, again, doesn't super matter. At least I hope it doesn't matter. If we get to the point where Leglu is playing for us, things have gone sideways quickly. No offense to Leglu, but I mean... Yikes. Uh, Moving on to my Venmo question from Nick. I'll leave it at Nick because this is one of those questions that's going to have somebody ostracized. (laughs) But I'm glad people feel comfortable asking me these questions because I promise you, if you ask some other people, you're just going to get absolutely, your head is going to get ripped off. But here is the question. Are the 2019 Packers frauds? He goes on to say, I think we all might know slash think that deep down. The good news for me is that this oddly isn't that specific, <laughs> so I've got a lot of leeway to work with here. The, the question is, what do you mean by frauds, I guess? If we just want to look at it from the standpoint of, does does the Packers play warrant an 11-3 and record? I think you could make the case that this isn't exactly an 11-3 and team. No, it is, so it kind of it's, it's a tough argument to make that an 11-3 and team isn't an 11-3 and team, because you won 11 games and lost three. But I think if that's all we're saying, then that maybe is fair. I'm not sure I can come much further to meet you at that that conclusion, though. Now, another possibility is we're looking at it and saying the teams that belong in the playoffs are teams like the 49ers. The 49ers are 11-3. and They are third in points, sixth in yards. Their defense is third in points and second in yards. They're basically top five in every single category. Are the Packers the same as the 49ers? No. But again, the word fraud itself is kind of, it's kind of hard to, because I don't think you have to be top five in every category in order to be worthy of a playoff berth. And to take that a step further, you can look at teams that won the Super Bowl that you could technically call frauds. The last time the Packers won the Super Bowl, you could probably say that they were frauds. There were a lot of people, probably myself included, that said they're just not even going to be in the playoffs. And then they made it into the playoffs and they fraudulently went, went on to win game after game after game. The Giants the very next year were frauds. Again, depending on what the word fraud means in this context. So, you know, we we know the Packers are not perfect, but I also don't want to... I think they deserve a little bit more credit than what they're getting. In fact, if anything, you know, there was a time at which maybe the Packers are getting a little bit too much credit. I think at this point in the season, they're getting not enough credit. As I've been saying all along, you, you don't get 11 wins when you're a bad team. That doesn't happen. And we've seen a lot of times teams that are similar to the Packers that are... 3-11 3-11 and 11 instead of 11-3 and three because there's something to be said about finding a way to win in the end. There's something to be said about a team that has so much talent in different places that when one, one side powers down, the other side kind of comes up and finds a way to win. When the offense stalls out, the defense comes in and, and comes in with a clutch performance. The other side of this, too, and there's an interesting contrast between yards and points for the Packers, and I think it kind of creates sort of that tension that a lot of people feel. What I mean by that is The Packers' offense is 21st in yards, but they're 12th in points. The Packers' defense is 23rd in yards, but they're 9th in points. They're top 10 as far as allowing other teams to score points. So I think there's there's a tension there because what we're watching, 
you know, the, the points are sort of the, the thing that happen less often. Yards are what happen every single play. And so we're watching an offense that is terrible at gaining yards. They, they just stall out constantly, and it's really hard to watch, and it's really frustrating. There are literally 20 other teams that move the ball better than the Green Bay Packers. There are only 11 that score more points, though. And defensively, there, there are 22 teams that give up less yards than the Packers' defense. An easier way to say that is there are only nine teams that give up more yards, but there are only eight teams that allow less points. And I think some of us, and myself included, you, it's frustrating because you're watching an offense that can't move and you're watching a defense that can't stop anybody. But we also tend to forget that points are all that matter. Yards matter insofar as you feel as though if you continue to allow teams to do this, you're going to give up more points. In other words, the dam is going to break at some point. You can't keep giving up these yards and then just take away the points at the very end. At some point, the team is just going to get a bunch of points. But for the most part, they've been doing it all year. And specifically, if you look at this defense, the San Francisco 49ers game was not great. But if you look at the four other games besides that, they have allowed 13 points, 15 points, 13 points, and 16 points. The most points that this team has allowed defensively since November 4th, I guess, is uh, 16 points. And even if you go beyond that, 26, 24, 24, 22, 24, 34, 16, 16, 3. There's only two games this year where you can look at the defense and go, that was a bad performance. 26 points in the NFL is not that bad. That's what the Chargers scored. On average, teams are scoring maybe mid-20s. Maybe. And if this if this offense could be more consistent, I mean, this team, I mean, I can't even really make the statement that they would be more consistently winning because they do consistently win. They only lost three games this year. But you get my point, right? I mean, the, if the Packers can consistently score more than about 24 and the Packers' defense could keep them consistently under 24, what exactly is fraudulent about that? I know it's not perfect, but we can't hold any team to a standard of perfect. I would like them to be more consistent. I would like the offense especially to find more consistency through four quarters to not stall out to be able to play better against good defenses. Although, again, 21 points against the Bears is about the most points. Most teams don't score 21 against the Bears, so you can't really super complain about that either. So I, I guess the answer to the question is no, I wouldn't go so far as to say fraud. They're, I don't think they're the best team in the NFL, but that doesn't make them frauds. And if you want to say they're not quite 11-3, and three, that's fine, but I, I, I've gone through. Let me see if I have it here. Yeah, so I, I did this thing a while ago just for fun where I, ra- I I took teams and their records and then I looked at their PFF score to kind of get an idea of how good they are to, to gauge whether they are over or under what they should be. In other words, the Dallas Cowboys were a minus five because they're based on how good their PFF grade was, I said that they should be around an 11-win team, but they had six wins at the time, meaning there is a five-win discrepancy there. So they are five games under what they are or should be expected to be. The Green Bay Packers, I had a plus two because at the time they had 10 wins and I said that they were about an eight and five team, meaning that they were about two games higher than what they probably should be. But there's a lot of, of teams that have, I mean, I don't think anybody, the, the only team that was right on where they should be was the Cincinnati Bengals at one win. But for example, teams that are bigger frauds, number one was the Jets. Number two was the Chiefs. So the Jets were five wins above what they should be. The Kansas City Chiefs were four wins above what they should be. I had the Dolphins, the Jaguars, and the Texans three wins above what they should be. And then the Raiders, Bears, Bills, and Packers were two wins above what they should be. And then you got a bunch of of teams here. Uh, Cardinals, Redskins, Panthers, Browns, Falcons, Chargers, Colts, and Patriots are one win above what they should be. And this isn't an exact science, but you get my point, right? It's not as though everybody has earned their exact record and the Packers are just these complete frauds. They're basically a 500 team that somehow is getting lucky. No, not not by as far as I can kind of gauge this. Maybe they've got about two wins above where they should be if we just went based on talent and, and assigned records to teams based on talent. And again, there's a lot of ifs, right? What, what is the exact metric for grade to, to record for one? And then how much stock do we put into PFF and whatever? And again... Nobody is dead on except the Cincinnati Bengals. Some are overperforming, some are, some are underperforming. And it's not even a knock against a team if you're overperforming. Overperforming, generally the way I look at it, means you're a well-coached team. 
right? If you don't have talent, but you're finding ways to win despite the talent, that's a positive sign. What you don't want is to be the Dallas Cowboys, where your talent is is an 11 win team, but you only manage six wins. Those are the teams when you're looking at it, you need to fire your coach. The Denver Broncos minus three. They they've got a really scary defense if you just look at talent and the offense. You know it's lacking in some places, but it's 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 not the worst. And so that's problematic. Now, should they fire their coach? No, it's his first year. We'll give him some more time. So, you know, again, my, my answer is no. I understand the frustration. I understand the desire for, please, can we be more consistent? Please, can we stop stalling out and find answers to these questions or, or whatever the, the case may be? But they're an 11-win team. And for every negative you can find, it's it's sort of sort of like that whole, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction thing that we learned in school a long time ago for every negative thing that you can come up with for why they shouldn't be an 11 win team there's automatically a positive that's generated because they are an 11 win team right how do you get to 11 wins despite and then go ahead and list all the negatives about this team despite a b c d e and f they're an 11 win team so go ahead and lay them all out all the things for all the reasons why this team doesn't deserve to be an 11 win team and every single one of those things points to something extra special about this team to be an 11 win team despite those dis- deficiencies and those things whatever it is that you got to find out how we ended up getting to 11 wins despite those things are things that a lot of other teams probably don't have what are the 49ers if they had the Packers deficiencies do they have 11 wins no they've got 11 wins with the all the talent and everything else that they have which I don't even know if they're that super talented I don't know so again I you know it, it would be more of something for a discussion than it is a question because we'd have to kind of and you went all in with the word fraud, so you, you know I can't just give you a blanket yes on that. I mean, th- this is something to be respected and admired. I don't know if they're going to win the Super Bowl. I'm not going to tell you they're the best team in football, but 11-3 and three in Lafleur's first year, winning the NFC North, possibly a number two seed, the, the number two team in the NFC. I'm sorry, I, c- I can't call that team a fraud. Just, just f- I mean, maybe we could have a discussion about it, but I mean, that's... I mean, I'm, I, I would have to have this podcast pulled from me if I'm calling them frauds after winning the number two seed in the in the NFC. I just, I can't do that. So again, the, the best I can maybe do is say that based on some of the talent that they have and some of the inconsistencies, they look at times more like a 10 or 9 win team or whatever, but every team has that. We see it every week when teams that get blown out by teams that are nowhere near as good as them. That's football. The point is, find a way to win. As I said before, the, the, the most true statement that has ever been said in football, that, that the conclusion that I've come to after doing this for as long as I've been doing this now, every single day, is just win. Just win is the most important thing that is ever that you could ever a, a, try to achieve. I'll get the words out someday. It's the most important thing that you can do. Find a way. It doesn't matter if it's ugly. The only reason ugly is problematic is because it sort of we believe it foreshadows the future, which is a unfortunate future. The, the problem with that argument is that we've been wrong. If we were looking at the first three weeks and we were looking at it saying the defense is great, but with this offense, we're never going anywhere. Despite the fact that they found a way to win, the feeling that we had is this isn't good enough for us to be an 11-win team. We'll never be an 11-win team with this, this kind of a team. The inconsistency, the lack of offensive production, that has to change or else we're not going to be a playoff team. Look where we are now. They didn't fix it. And, and, and at times when the offense did find their groove, found their rhythm, the defense fell off. Whenever this guy comes up, this guy goes down. When that guy goes down, this guy comes up. They've been doing it all year, but the, the one consistent thing that they've done this year, with the exception of three games, is to find a way to win. And that's the only thing that matters. And especially when we're talking about playoff football. There are no style points. The only thing that matters is a team that grinds, that, that doesn't quit. And it's, you know it feels like they quit. But we know what quitting looks like. The team that quits is the team that loses. They, they stall, and it looks like they cut the engines, but they find a way to win. And when you get into the playoffs, that's the only thing that matters. I don't know how the Packers go to San Francisco to beat them, but I don't have to worry about that right now. And neither do you. Neither does anybody else. we got some time to figure it out. All we need to focus on right now is beating the Minnesota Vikings so that we can lock up that number two seed. That's all we got to figure out. And, and here's the other thing. If the Packers beat the 49ers, it shatters a lot of this narrative. If they lose, it's expected. And we still win the division, and we still go to the playoffs, and we still have the opportunity to shut a lot of people up. If the Packers win, everything gets flipped on its head. Because the Packers aren't supposed to win. The Vikings don't lose in Minnesota. The Vikings are better than the Packers, so they say. 
Aaron Rodgers is a fraud. You know, it's all just the refs and blah, 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 blah. If the Packers beat the Vikings, who can't they beat exactly? Especially if we're doing it from Lambeau. You know, part of what I have to do is analyze things. But at some time, at, at some point, we analyze things too much. And again, I tend to be somewhat of a negative person. I try not to be. That's just where I go naturally. I'm the person that watches football, and when we don't get a first down, I just throw a temper tantrum because like, we're not going to win now. I'm trying to stop that because at the end of the day, this is supposed to be fun. Let's root for the team, be excited about the team. Because at the end of the day, as much as I, I really don't understand the overly positive people, they are all exactly right that if you can't enjoy an 11-3 and Packers team, there's, there's no point to watching football. If the only way that people like me and people like Nick can be happy is to be undefeated, to be a team that has no weaknesses, and a team that wins the Super Bowl every year, we're never going to be happy. There always is going to be struggle, and you got to embrace the struggle. You have to. Every team has weaknesses. Embrace it. We have to learn to embrace the weaknesses, the strengths, the struggles, the climbs, the falls, all of it. If you're a, if you're a fan of a particular team, you got to be ready to, you know, endure all of that and ride with them no matter what. Not to say you can never critique the team, but you know, you, you got to find that line. And it might be different for every person, but you know, you got to look a little bit introspectively and say, "Dude, I I just called an 11 and 3 Packers team frauds." That's my thought. And again, I'm coming from the standpoint of being you're my people. I understand how your mind works. It's why I don't just come on here and, and, and eviscerate you, because I know how your mind works. I'm just telling you, you're going to be a miserable person if you're a Packers fan that only likes Packers teams that are basically undefeated. And by the way, when was the last time the Packers were 11-3? and three? I mean, the Packers haven't even had 11 wins by the end of the season since 2014. And even that year, they were, they never got to 11-3. and three. They got to 10-3, and three, and then they lost to the Buffalo Bills and went 10-4. and four. So the only time that this has happened was 2011. They went 13 and 0 and lost to the Kansas City Chiefs to go 13 and 1 and ended the season 15 and 1, which is great. And that was a fun time, right? That was back in the day when everybody in the media said this is an unbeatable a team that can't lose. Nobody can beat this team. This offense is unbelievable and it was. Unfortunately, it was one of the worst defenses in the league and that bore itself out when we played the Giants and gave up 37 points, which was the second highest point total that had that the defense had given up all year because you got that extra volatility and the offense didn't play all that well. The only team to score more points than that was the Chargers and the Packers scored 45 points because it was the 2015 Packers. But but again, my point is, if this is all we want, I, I demand 15-1, and one, number one offense in football, and also I demand that we go on into the playoffs and win and go to the Super Bowl and win it. And, and listen, I, I got a friend, my best friend from Illinois, Chicago Bears fan, also a Denver Broncos fan. He gave up football because he's one of these people. He says the only thing that matters is Super Bowls, and anything less than that is a failure. Guess what? Football makes that guy miserable. And so he walked away, and that's the right thing to do. Because you're going to be miserable all the time. Because you're going to lose a lot, and you're going to see a lot of terrible play, and you're going to see a lot of interceptions and fumbles and, and sacks on third and short when you could have been kicked a field goal to go up by two scores but instead you decide to throw a really deep pass to only one wide receiver who magically doesn't get open when one guy is trying to get open against six defenders and then somebody comes through and sacks your quarterback and now you're out of field goal range that stuff will drive you crazy but you know what every team endures it every fan base has to watch that stuff happen and just say why did that happen that's what football is And now it's even worse because we got the layer of referees. And I I just think that's, I had this thought this morning, that's just a part of this game now. Complaining about referees. Plays that, calls that go against you that are just infuriating. Calls that go for you that are terrible, that you just feel terrible about. Because it's like, why did you make that call? Because now everything that's been done, all this entire drive, which, you know, if it's it's not, you, you almost, you don't hope it's not a scoring drive. But if it is, it's got that asterisk next to it. Just like what happened when the Packers won last week. Well, we could easily take away seven points from the Packers for that. Which you can't, but it's just it causes those kinds of... That's football now. And if you can't deal with it, you're going to be miserable. So even if the Packers lose on Monday, and I don't want them to, of course we all want them to win, there needs to be a part of us that says that it's okay. That our lives will continue. That an 11-4 and team that split with the Vikings and beat the Bears twice, and beat the the Lions twice, 
that that's still an okay season, especially when you win the division and are the, you know, number whatever seed in the division. There has to be at least a little part of you as angry and disappointed as you are, which is fine after a loss. You're, you're allowed to go off and just storm off and throw a temper tantrum. But there has to be a point at which you come back and say, okay, this is still okay. And again, I'm just trying to help you out because this is after a three-game winning streak in which the Packers' defense hasn't allowed more than 15 points and is now 11-3. and three. And your question is, are the Packers frauds? Not mad at the question. I'm just worried about you, man. I want you to be happy, and I want you to enjoy the Packers a little bit. Enjoy the season. Enjoy 11-3. and three. We might not see 11-3 and three for a very long time. Again, the last time we saw 11-3 and three was 2011. This might be another eight years before we see this, man. Enjoy this. I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe this is a fluke, and everybody figures out LaFleur after one year, just like what happened with Nagy, and then everything goes downhill, and it's just a terrible... Enjoy it, please. Please enjoy this. That's it. I think I've made my point. So anyways, I'm going to push one of these things off until tomorrow. I think we'll take a break and then look at these games and then call it a day. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have. Because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple. Just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop. That's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place. And you can get the app and try it out for yourself. So go ahead and test drive U.S. Cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days. That's U.S. Cellular, built for us. Terms apply, awards based on open signal independent data. So go to uscellular.com for all the details. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. So one of the things that I wanted to save until tomorrow, but since it's already kind of coming out, um, Todd had asked a question about, you know, Mike Zimmer possibly shutting down this team, at, at least to some degree, because this game doesn't have a lot of importance. And, and that actually is exacerbated by the 49ers winning because the, the Vikings now have locked up a spot. So they're, they're not going to get the number one or two seed, and they are officially in the playoff. So I don't want to say this game doesn't matter, but as far as Dalvin Cook and even Alexander Madison being shut down, in other words, the, the question being, is health the most important thing? And I think it is. And I actually think it is for the Packers as well, even though this game has a higher importance because they want that number two spot. But for the Vikings, this game just does not carry a ton of weight. And I know people hate hearing that, but again, the reason I'm bringing this up is because I just saw a tweet come across my phone by one of the guys, I don't remember his name right now, but one of the big media guys saying he expects them to shut down Alexander Madison because what's the point? So they're just going to run Mike Boone. That's not an official word, but not Ian Rappaport. Who's the other guy? The other guy, the Rappaport wannabe guy, I don't think he's going to say something like that unless he has some pretty good information that he thinks that's going to happen. So at this point, I do think that that's exactly what's going on. I think that they recognize that they really want to, and they're not going to get home field advantage maybe the first week or whatever. And it looks like, if I'm not mistaken, the best that they could really do is go from a sixth seed to a fifth seed, and that's if Seattle loses to the 49ers. And actually, that's not true. It's only if Seattle loses to the Cardinals and the 49ers, which is not going to happen. I'm, I really, I hate to tell you that. I mean, if it maybe, I, I, maybe, but it's 
So what, what are they shooting for here? They're not going to get the, the no, number one seed. They're not going to get the number two seed. They're not going to get the number three seed because that's going to be the Packers. They're not going to get the four seed because that's Dallas who won their division. So they're going to risk losing one of their running backs to go from a sixth seed to a fifth seed, which is almost impossible for them to get. Seattle has to lose out for them to move from a sixth seed to a five seed. And even at, the, even at that, they're not going to play at home because the fifth seed is just going to play the Dallas Cowboys, the fourth seed, in Dallas. And I listen, I, I understand some people hear this and they just shake their head like, no team would ever do anything like that, ever. You play to win 100% all the time. There has to be some kind of a cost-benefit analysis in football. I'm really sorry to tell the purists that. There has to be. There has to be some part of you that says winning in the playoffs is more important than beating the Packers for pride. And listen, they still think they're going to beat the Packers, but you're not going to risk losing your running backs, which is a central part of your entire team is running the football, just to beat the Packers for the sake of beating the Packers. If it, so beating the Packers is more important than winning in the playoffs? And by the way, if, if the Packers um, do end up not getting that, that uh, in other words, if the Packers end up being the number three seed instead of the number two seed, the Vikings are going to go to Lambeau and play the Packers. I'm guessing they want their running backs healthy to beat the Packers next time because there's going to be a lot more pride involved in that game and a lot more need for your running backs when you're playing away in Lambeau Field in the freezing cold in January. It's going to be more important to have, you know, Dalvin Cook and Alexander Madison going at full speed in that game than it is in this game. And a game that they probably believe that they can win with Mike Boone anyways because they're at home. Their defense is just just freakish when they're at home. So again, the cost benefit is so far in the direction and it, it, it depends on his ankle. If his ankle's fine, you're not going to shut him down just for the heck of it. But the point is if it's iffy and if you're worried about injuring it further, absolutely you shut him down. Because there's just nothing more to gain or lose in this game. And that's what I kind of talked about yesterday. How this game, the it, as important as it feels, because it's down to the wire and it's a divisional matchup, the fact of the matter is the Packers won the division, unless there's some freakish thing where they lose to the Lions who have completely shut down for the season. So the, the Packers win the division. Um... The Vikings cannot get a bye. They're locked into the playoffs. The best they can do is get a number five seed, which is also impossible. So the Vikings are a sixth seed no matter what happens in this game. And you're going to risk losing a running back for the playoffs on the off chance that what? The Packers lose to the Lions next week and we end up sneaking into the three seed? Again, it's all cost-benefit depending on his ankle. If his ankle's fine, you play him. But you already got guys. It's going to drive me nuts. What is that guy's name? Adam Schefter. Here is his tweet. He must have sent it out a second time because I got it up again. With the Vikings now having wrapped up a playoff slot, it doesn't make a lot of sense for Minnesota to play an injured running back Alexander Madison. And so with Dalvin Cook out and Madison hobbled, Monday night figures to be the Mike Boone show. Again, I I don't think he's going to tweet that out unless he has some kind of information that that's going to be the case. So I expect him to be shut down. And and I listen, this this was a question I was going to save for tomorrow. And it, it does make sense. And again, I know there are purists out there that say you never do that. And I've got another kind of purist question for tomorrow as far as tanking. And I'll, I'll clarify my position on that because the question is is correct. But anyways, whatever, that'll be for tomorrow. But there absolutely is a situation in which you would prioritize the health of a key player, especially since we don't know when Dalvin's coming back. He's probably coming back next week. But if he's not, and if you risk hurting Alexander Madison, you might not have a running back for the first round of the playoffs. Other than Mike Boone, that's that's not a good situation to be in. Make sure you've got Madison, who's done a great job this year, ready to rock and roll for the playoffs. So I kind of cheated on that question, having this tweet come out at that exact time. And again, I wanted to talk about it today instead of tomorrow, because it'll be old news by tomorrow anyways. But yes, uh, I do think it's possible that there is a bit of a, a gearing down. Of course, the Vikings are coming 100,000%. They want this win badly. But you have to be smart about it. Somebody at some level has to be smart enough to look at this and say, listen, I know we want and need to beat the Packers. We cannot risk losing a running back just because maybe it gives us a little bit more of an edge to beat the Packers. Can't do it. So, anyways, there's that. Anyways, let's look at a few of these games. We'll rip through them because, um, you know, implications, there aren't much these days. Uh, Giants, Redskins. And, and part of the question for tomorrow, Richard, is talking about tanking because I'm going to be talking about that quite a bit today. <sighs> I don't want to answer the question. I won't. I'll save it for tomorrow. So I'll just continue talking like I don't know anything about it. The only thing that matters in this game is the draft. Think about it from the standpoint of the Giants and the Redskins. I'm pretty sure both of these teams only have three wins. Confirmed. Just look it up. Three wins. Obviously, this is an extreme example, but let me just lay the groundwork here. If you're a three-win team, forget about how you go about doing it. Just just from 
fans' standpoint, forget about actually tanking, forget about a memo to all the players, which I've never said, but let's, you know, leave all that aside. If you're a fan, and you're a fan of the New York Giants, for example, and you've got a new quarterback, and you've got an elite running back, and you've got a revamped offensive line, which isn't great, but whatever, and you've got a couple pieces on defense, but you still have a really bad defense, and you have zero pass rush, you have the opportunity to draft Chase Young in this draft. And the only way that's going to happen is if you lose to the Redskins. What matters more to you, Chase Young or pride that you beat the Washington Redskins? Again, forget the team aspect. As a fan, what do you want? I know for a fact there are fans that will say, I want to win. Because that's just a different kind of fan. And, And again, you fan how you want to fan. I can never be that person. Because I see the bigger picture. The bigger picture is, in my opinion, you want to win because all you care about is today. And I want to watch my team win because that's what I do. I just cheer and yay, I want to win. But what you're not doing is acknowledging that in the future you're going to lose more game. You're hurting the future for the sake of the present. Again, it's a much more complicated question when you talk about implementing a tank, which we'll talk about tomorrow. But just just look at it from the fan standpoint. If you are a Giants fan or a Redskins fan and you're rooting to win, you're doing it wrong. And as painful as it might be to root for your team to lose, you got to find a way to do it. Because that's dumb. You're going to give up an opportunity to to potentially even have a number one pick, but for sure a top three pick, possibly even a number two overall pick. You're going to throw that away and end up picking seven and get some garbage guy that's probably not going to do much, like an interior offensive lineman, as opposed to like a Chase Young type guy. And why? Because you wanted to beat the Redskins? Tell me how that makes sense in your mind. Well, because a real fan would... Get your real fan out. Yeah, a real fan wants to lose in the future because you can't... It's more important for you to beat the Redskins than to possibly have a shot at a guy like Chase Young who could help us be a playoff team or possibly win a Super Bowl one of these days. You're telling me I'm the bad fan because I actually want this team to be good because a 4-11 and team doesn't mean as much to me as possibly being a playoff team next year? Yeah, I'll be that fan. I'll be the guy that wants to win the playoffs next year. You go ahead and be the guy that wants to be 4-11 for, for the next five years. You be that guy, I'll be this guy. I, I get what you're saying. You're not a real fan if you root against your team. In a very closed-off, closed-minded sense, that makes sense. But if you just open up your mind a little bit and think about the whole picture, because everything, again, every action has an equal and opposite reaction. There's more things happening than just a win. You can't pretend that the only thing that happened today is we won. That's not the only thing that happened. You won, which means your record went higher, which means other teams that lost, when the Lions lose, when the Redskins lose, when the Cardinals lose, when the Dolphins lose, when, when whatever, they all stay low or go lower than you and you move up the draft board and you pick team players that are not as good. And I understand there are certain times it doesn't super matter, right? But in this context, it matters. If you have the opportunity for a number two pick, if you're the Cincinnati Bengals, don't you dare root for the if you're a Bengals fan and you're rooting for the Bengals to beat the Dolphins, you deserve to get kicked right in the face. I, I, I just, you know, fan how you want to fan, but I'm gonna fan how I fan, and I'm gonna fan by kicking you right in the nose. What is wrong with you if you're a Bengals fan and you want to beat the Dolphins? You have to be brain damaged to want to beat the Dolphins. You've got the number one pick you're gonna give up your future quarterback, the guy that's gonna lead your team to the new era because you want to beat the Dolphins? And then what? Then next year you win six games, and you pick 12th overall, and you miss out on quarterbacks next year, and you pick another, what, tackle, who's pretty good, but it doesn't matter because you don't have a quarterback and you don't have anything? Give me a break. I'm sorry, but at some point, you can take this too far. There's a point at which, you know, if we're talking about the difference between picking 15th and picking 18th, yeah, just win the game. It doesn't really matter. Win the game, pick 18th. There is a point at which pride matters. And winning at the end of the season matters, and all that stuff matters. But there's definitely a time when the purists are just wrong. The Bengals need to lose. And if you're the Dolphins, you need to lose. And again, I'm not talking about implementation. That's a separate question. I'm just talking about from the fans' standpoint. Forget the team. Forget the coach and the players and all that stuff, because I'm not talking about that. From the fans' standpoint, you want your team to lose. right, now, if you're Oakland and you're 6-8, and if you want to root for your team to win, fine. Six and eight, seven and eight doesn't make a huge difference. No, it might because there's a ton of five win teams, and if they end up winning and you can go beneath them, fine. But, you know, Chicago, seven and seven. 
the, the only team that has more wins that's out of the playoffs is the Rams at eight and seven. Or, or and and well, Tennessee isn't. I don't think they're officially out. I don't know. Maybe they are. They've also got eight wins. The bottom line is they're going to be picking like 18, 19. Oh, they don't even have a first round. So yeah, definitely you win because who cares? You're going to go up what two picks higher in the second round? Win, just win. I, I don't want you to win. I'm just saying if you're a fan of the Bears. Do not root against them because you're going to move up two spots in the second round. That's dumb. But again, from a fan standpoint, there are certain teams that I'm very sorry, and I know you're loyal, and I know you got Bengals wallpaper all over your house, and your your bathroom is a Bengals toilet, or out, you know, Steelers toilet, or whatever. But if you care about your team winning in the future, it's more important that you lose. Okay? So the first game is Giants Redskins. The team that wins is the loser. End of conversation. That's just the way it is. The team that wins this game is the loser, and it's not even close to being debatable. If you think the pride of winning this is going to help in 2020 more than drafting a guy like Chase Young, you are out of your mind. You're a crazy person. Because there is no pride in being 4-11. and Nobody is finishing 4-11 and going, yeah, but we beat the Giants, son. Obviously, you're not going to finish the season 4-11, and but you get my point, right? You guys are trash. Yeah, but dude, do you see how we beat the Giants? Dude, kick the field goal in overtime, beat them. Totally dunked on them, bro. Going to the Super Bowl this year. Not how it works. Sorry about that. This is going to be every, at, at the end of the, at the end of every season, this is going to happen. I just, I know it's going to happen. It's what happened last year. It's going to happen next year. The conversation about tanking. Again, I'll clarify tomorrow what I'm talking about. Um, Saints and Titans. This feels like a bigger game than it kind of really is. Because the, the thought process for most Packers is probably that we want the Titans to win because then it gives the Packers a little bit more leeway to lose and still be number two. That's not how it works. If the Packers and the Saints both win, the Packers are the number two seed, right? Because we own that our own control, our own destiny. Unless the 49ers and Seahawks both lose, which is already done because they didn't. So that's forget that. Here's the other part, though. If the Packers and Saints both lose... The Saints then kind of take that spot from us. In other words, if if both teams lose, if the Packers and the Saints both lose, then by the end of this week, the Packers are the number two seed and everything seems super great, right? The problem is next week, if and when the Saints beat the, the Carolina Panthers and the Packers beat the Lions, the Packers lose that number two spot. There's some kind of a, you know, divisional tiebreaker thing going on with the Saints because they're going to beat a divisional opponent. So their in-division record makes them beat us as far as the tiebreaker at 12-4. and four. In other words, if we lose this game, we're probably going to lose the number two spot. The only way that we don't is if the Saints lose both games this week and next week. So really, it doesn't super matter because the Saints aren't going to lose two in a row. The Packers just need to win. So yeah, it's going to help our odds ever so slightly, right? So in other words, if the if the Saints lose to the Titans and the Packers lose to the Vikings, we absolutely need the Saints to lose to the Carolina Panthers. If they do, then yeah, we get the number two back. So it, it gives us a little bit of an out, but it, the, it's not that... It's not that big of a thing because it's probably not going to happen. So yeah, we need to root for the Titans, but it's not as big of a deal. Because again, more than likely, if we lose this game, we lose our spot, even if the Saints lose to the Titans. So it's a big game for the Saints because they obviously want to claim that number two spot. And if they win and the Packers lose, they pretty much got it. As long as they can finish doing their job against the Carolina Panthers, which should be pretty easy work. It's also a big game for the Titans, however, because they still have the opportunity to uh, get into the playoffs. But if they lose to the Saints, I'm not sure how much of an opportunity they're going to have. I don't think it means they're eliminated, but it obviously makes it really, really tough. They're trying to beat out the Pittsburgh Steelers who are playing the Jets, so they really need to pull this off. So, go Titans, but again, like a lot of these other games, it feels like a bigger game than it is. Uh, Steelers-Jets, again, I just talked about the Steelers are kind of competing with the Titans, trying to get that number six seed or whatever one it is. Um, And to make matters worse, they're playing Baltimore next week, so they really, really need to beat the Jets. The Jets, on the other hand, are not playing for anything. And, uh, you know, at, at five wins, there's a lot of five win teams. There's the Denver Broncos, there's the Chargers, there's the Jaguars, there's the Panthers, there's the Falcons. There's a lot of teams that if, if, you know, if three of those teams go on to win and you lose, you just moved up three spots in the draft. Again, I know people don't want to hear it. I don't care. Five wins is kind of at that point where if you keep winning, you're going to be picking at late teens. If you keep losing, you're probably top 10. If you end the season at five wins, you're going to be a top 10 pick with a real outside shot at maybe even being top five. And that's 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 generally my metric. There, there's those, those kind of breaking points, right? If you have the opportunity to be top five, that's huge. If you can be top 10, that's really huge. If you're outside of the top 10, kind of doesn't super matter. Like if you don't have a chance of being inside the top 10, it doesn't really that matter that much. 
and I, I say that based on I did a little bit of a study in the past looking at PFF grades in comparison to where they were picked in the draft, and there's a definite drop off after around like 10 to 12 to where the, the number 12 pick and the number 20 pick, there's like no difference. Obviously, this isn't the entire history of football. I just like two years or something. I did three years. But um, there's, there's a definite difference. And it probably matter, changes from draft to draft how many truly elite players there are. But, you know, as a general rule, once you get outside of 10, there's probably not. And there's going to be some good football players, but there's not the automatic guys. It's just kind of a, a luck thing, right? Like Kenny Clark. He obviously would have been a top 10 pick if anybody knew he was going to be that good, but he fell to the Packers because nobody really knew, and then it just becomes luck. Getting that guy that you hope can kind of pan out, and usually they don't, but sometimes they do. Bengals-Dolphins, as I talked about, both teams, and and, and, and to kind of give a preview to tomorrow, I don't think any of the players are going to be quitting, but as a fan base, it's just, this is all about the draft. It's only about the draft. And if the Bengals win this game against the Dolphins, they are just the worst. And to be fair, they're still the number one pick, so they can afford to do that once because then they have two wins, and everybody else has at least three. So you can win one and still be all right, but I don't know, man. Uh, you're playing a dangerous game, playing the Browns the next week. You go on to win two in a row and lose that spot. Oh, makes me sick just thinking about it, like legitimately sick. The, o- the only real reason, and, and it, it's only if you're super big on like losing just destroys the psyche of a team. And even at that, again, we're talking about a team winning – the, diff- the difference between a three-win team and a one-win team, you're going to tell me that it makes that big of a difference? I'm going to tell you you're wrong. But the only argument you can make is, well, if they're okay with Chase Young and Joe Burrow and Tua, then you could probably win two in a row, still probably maybe be a top three, and then get one of those guys. But I just, I'm not playing that game, man. I'm sorry. I'm just not playing it. We got number one locked up, and we need it. The Bengals have been one of those teams that have picked at like 12 to 15 for like a dozen years. And so they can never upgrade their quarterback. They can never really truly upgrade anything. They get these kind of good, not great, mediocre players because they're a good, not great, mediocre team. That's the worst thing you can be, by the way. Obviously, the the ideal is to be a Super Bowl caliber team. But if you're not, rip that thing all the way to the ground and draft high. The Bengals don't, though, because they're okay being mediocre. At least this is the inside in, excuse me, the inside information I had received on them. That they they just care about being good enough to get people in the seats and make some money, and they don't really care. If they were smart, they'd rip that thing down to the ground, be a team like what they are now, get the number one overall pick, and actually start making some progress here. Uh, Panthers-Colts, this is a, a massive who cares kind of game. Uh, both teams are out of the playoffs, but neither team is like a three win, so it's you know it kind of doesn't super matter. So it's just, you know, whatever. Better luck next year, I guess. There's not, not a whole lot going on there. Um, Ravens-Browns. Again, it's another one that maybe it might feel like there's some implications here, but there's not much. The Ravens almost can't lose their spot. They're, they're basically locked at number one. The only way that that would change is if the Ravens lose out, which is to lose two games in a row. They lose to the Browns, they lose to the Steelers, and the Patriots win next week because they already won one. So if that doesn't happen, and I'm assuming it's not, the, Patri- the Ravens are 100% the number one seed. And for the Browns, they're not eliminated, but there is only a 1% chance that they get in, and here's how it needs to happen. This week, The Browns obviously have to win. The Jets have to beat the Steelers. The Saints have to beat the Titans. And the Colts have to beat the Panthers. That's just this week. Next week, the Browns have to beat the Bengals, obviously. The Ravens have to beat the Steelers. The Texans have to beat the Titans. And the Colts have to beat the Jaguars. If all those things happen, the Browns get a shot. So, in other words, the Browns are basically out. The Ravens are going to be number one. Nothing really matters. The Browns are going to win this, or the Ravens are going to win this game. So, there you go. Falcons, Jaguars, again, another game that probably means more to lose than win, but not enough that you would actually, maybe even as a fan, root for that. I guess the only real be- benefit for the Falcons is to try to make sure that they're not last in the division. But I also don't think Carolina is going to be winning many games to try to climb out of last place. So I think the Falcons are safe either way. Raiders, Chargers, who cares? The Raiders are another team they got a 1% chance of getting that 6 seed. The Chargers, who cares? Because they're just never going to be a good team. You know, last year was the one time they played up to their potential. This year they got another good team. And they, they do have a lot of issues with injuries. But I'm just, I, I just, I've given up hope on the Chargers. And we saw when, when the Chargers and Packers played, that's the potential the Chargers have. When they're all in, they've got some talent. But then you watch them play the next week when, you know, you want to believe, well, this is a good team, that's why we lost, and they play like garbage. And it's like, why couldn't you have done that against us? Detroit and Denver. Now, this is an area where there's going to be contention between me and uh, other Packers fans. I am 100,000% rooting for Detroit to win this game. It's not even close in my mind. 
I don't care how much you hate Detroit, how much pride you have, how many Packers tattoos you have, do not root for Detroit to lose this game. The Lions right now are in line to be picking in the top three. The Packers are going to beat the Lions next week. So the best that we can hope for is that Detroit is a four-win team. If this team loses out and somehow ends up with a a top two pick and gets Chase Young, I'm going to flip out. They're already probably going to get a pretty good player. But if they end up getting a player that is, let's just say, I I, I don't even know. I would say Khalil Mack, but given what Khalil Mack did this past year, he's going to be better than Khalil Mack. You saw what the Bosa's did to us. Imagine a guy that's that good, possibly better, twice a year for the next 10 years. I don't want to deal with that. If they end up getting Jerry Judy, that stinks, whatever. We dealt with Megatron, we'll be all right. They got to get a new quarterback pretty soon anyways. It's probably going to be a disaster, whatever. I just don't want Aaron Rodgers being assaulted twice a year for the next 10 years by Chase Young. And maybe they get a quarterback. I, I I don't know. I just know that I don't want them getting those super, super elite freaks that are gone by pick three. There's only like one or two or three of them in any draft. In my opinion, there's really only one in this draft other than, you know, maybe a quarterback or whatever. I don't really super care. There's, there's just one guy I really, really, really don't want him to get. And, you know, again, there's there's still going to probably get somebody that's going to be a constant nuisance, guy that's going to be, you know, really help the Lions out. But somebody that's going to haunt our nightmares, just please don't get that guy. So, yes, I'm going to be rooting for Detroit to beat Denver. And thankfully, the the Denver Broncos have nothing to live for and maybe just might be willing to oblige, despite the fact that I think Denver is a much better team than Detroit, especially considering all the injuries that Detroit has. And to be honest, I'm shocked that they're activating their running back. I think if this was 2018 Brian Gutekunst, he'd have shut him down for the year. Like, ooh, I don't know, man. (laughs) That looks pretty bad. I think we're shutting you down. Which, by the way, that's how you tank. But nope, they're going to activate their running back, bring him back. More power to you. Go for it. Beat Denver. Godspeed, et cetera, et cetera. Again, you fan how you want to fan, but I'm telling you, we do not want Detroit to lose this game. Cardinal Seahawks. This is the most important game outside of Packers Viking. The only possible way that we get this number one seed, as I said, is for the Cardinals to beat the Seahawks and then the Seahawks to beat the 49ers. That's it. That's the only possible way. If the Seahawks win, we're not getting it. Very, 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 very important game. Extremely unlikely, but unlikely stuff happens every week. Let it be this week. It's a divisional game. Crazy stuff happens. I don't know. Cowboys Eagles, I couldn't really care any less. Um, it's it's a very big game for the Eagles. They have to win out in order to get that spot. And the reason I say that is because the Cowboys are playing the Redskins in Week 17, which is going to be a win. So the Eagles need to win this game and next week. We'll see what happens again. I don't really super care. Um, I think both teams. I mean, I know we lost to the Eagles, but to, I mean to be completely honest, both of these teams have enough talent on their roster to beat the Packers. Both of these teams are very beatable. For the Packers. So I'm, I'm not trying to be super disrespectful and be like, I don't care. They're both garbage. I'm not worried about it. Anything can happen. I'm just saying I, I don't really have a really big rooting interest either way. So whoever it is you think has the upper hand in beating the Packers in the playoffs, root for them to lose. I don't super care. I'm a tiny bit scared of both of them anyways. And then Chiefs Bears, I don't really see any reason to uh, root for the Bears in this. Again, the draft, there's really not any implications. And so the psychological aspect of the Bears losing is much more important in my mind because the Bears have to get to eight wins to be 500. And they're playing the Vikings next week, so they're probably going to lose next week. If they lose to the Chiefs, which they probably will, they are below 500 after going to the playoffs last year. That carries a lot of weight, in my opinion. From a psychological standpoint, from a Packers fan standpoint, from a Bears fan standpoint, like the whole ecosystem of the NFC North changes if they don't get to eight wins. And that excites me a little bit. So, yes, go Chiefs. But, uh, anyways, that's about it. That's all I got for you. Got some football. Again, not a ton of it really matters outside of, you know, probably wanting the Saints to win or the Titans to win just in case. Definitely want the Seahawks to lose. And then, uh, I want Detroit to win, and I want the Bears to lose. Otherwise, who cares? But it's a relaxing Sunday. We don't have to super freak out about anything. We got the day off, so I hope you all enjoy it, and uh, I'll talk to you all tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.